Well, first of all, I'm so happy to be here, and thank you all for coming. And I love Chicago, despite the weather. <laughs> and um, I'm very happy to be here with you, Rebecca. I'm, I love your work. And um, there's so many parallels in our work. I'm, I'm so excited about this conversation. Um, my name, yes. Well, I, you know, I say in the book that you know, it was never easy to be named Eve. Um, you know, a six-year-old having that name was a bit of a burden, right? Um, you know, he was responsible for a lot of bad things that happened, you know, sin and death and w women having horrible pregnancies, and it, it goes on. And um, I, that's, that, that was always a name that felt very heavy to carry and, and never particularly felt like my own. But when I wrote The Apology, which is the book I wrote before this, which was a letter that I r had my father write to me, apologizing to me for all the things he had done to me. Um, that investigation and that writing was very, very um, excruciating, but also very liberating, because I think I had put off trying to understand my father for most of my life, like he didn't warrant that. Um, he was just kind of put in the monster box and it was sealed, and, um, and yet, I was completely living his narrative because I was always in dialogue with him, always responding to an imaginary him, proving to him I wasn't what he thought I was, proving to him I was, you know, all those things. And when I finished that book, um, there's a line at the end of it which says, old man be gone. And I don't really know who wrote it, him or, if he wrote it or I wrote it, because I don't really know sometimes who wrote that book. Mm -hmm. I felt like he was very present through a lot of it. But at the end of it, it was like at the end of, um, when Tinkerbell just kind of disappears at the end of Peter Pan and goes into the ethers, that's what happened to my father. He just went and really hasn't been back. And I know he's in a better place, and I'm definitely in a better place. But at the end of, the, at the end of all that, I suddenly realized that I had no more rancor, I had no more bitterness, I had no more revenge, I had no more anything. But I didn't want to be named by him and I didn't want his name because I felt he didn't have my best interest at heart. And I wanted the last years of my life to be mine. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see if I could disentangle myself in name, in idea, from that patriarchal reality and to free myself from it and be done. And these have always been very good to me. Um, I love everything about them. Um, <laughs> um, and I feel like they're, it's a beautiful letter. It's open. It's invitational. It's welcoming. It's, it, um, and I have to say, you know, there is so much power in a name. Since I dropped that name, my life has changed so radically. I feel much more in myself, in my... I feel bolder. I don't feel like I have to apologize for things. I mean, that's an advantage of aging, too. Mm -hmm. But I think there's something in... Um, you know, I make a joke that I'm down to a letter and soon I'll be nothing, you know? <laughs> it's a, I mean, it's a very powerful letter, and I think that, you know, it certainly the V-Day project precedes, I think, I believe, right, your name change. Um, that, um, that echo, it feels like you're carrying, not only it's the shedding, but it feels like you're carrying your work with you. Mm -hmm. feels right, like, like you're identifying as your work in a way. Does that seem right, or is it? Well, I... Not so much work mm -hmm. as purpose. Right, right. As purpose, Just, like, yeah. I think that, um, for me, ending violence against women, girls, transgender, and non-binary people has always been, has always felt like the mother issue. Mm -hmm. It's felt like if we could figure this out, we would thereby dis defang patriarchy, we would, we would unravel it. And if women were free, and if women were safe, and if women knew they could do what they wanted, wear what they wanted, go where they wanted anytime, everything in our whole system would change overnight. So I think it's, it's a commitment to that. The name is a commitment to that. And, and I feel, um, but now it, I feel it is my life, right? I feel it is my life. And I think, I think one of the amazing things about getting older, I'm gonna be 70, next month. I mean, Happy it's birthday. like shocking. Um, um, but, but it also feels kind of, um, you know, I'm cooked. I'm, I'm, I've, I've, I'm kind of determined by now, you know. And, um, and I feel like that the commitment to the liberation of, of women and transgender and non-binary people has been um, something 
I'm so deeply connected to yeah. that, you know, when, when we opened City of Joy, Christine Schuler described her, who is the head of it, um, and I, we went to Paris and we decided we'd get a tattoo and we'd get the same tattoo and we'd commit ourselves to each other for life. Okay. You know, that we were opening this city in the middle of the Congo and it was going to be, I, I had her back and she had my back and I was there for her for life. And it was such a profound thing. And there was a, you know, we have a Congo on our back and then there's a V mm -hmm. where Buk Bukavu is. And it was kind of like that. It was like, it was like, it was like a name tattoo. Mm. It was like I am engraving this. I'm, I'm staining this into my soul. This commitment until I die. Mm. That yeah, that's amazing. That's, that's um, it, I think you know. There's something, and and you know, starting um, the book. I, I believe I, I could be wrong, but I believe there's there's mention of it at the beginning, and and just then this this real landing point at the end of the book of this is my name, this is who I am, and the whole book feels in so many ways like, you know, not only you know not only who I am now, but here's where I've come from, here's everything that's going on. So I want to talk to you about the structure of the book a little bit, um, and you know we have you know, different sections kind of themed by topic. Like, there's one about grief, there's one about AIDS, um, where it's, you know, you're collecting older writings, you're, um, in some cases, uh, explaining the occasion for the writing. And in other cases, there are pieces that just kind of exist with a date on the top. And I'm wondering if you could explain Partly, you know, you know, are, were any of those new? Are those taken from that moment? Are they looking back on a certain time? Were they written in that time? Um, and then how did you go about curating and bringing all these threads into this one, you know, it's a collection, but it feels like so much more than a collection, this one statement, this one piece. Mm. Well, I think, I think, you know, I, I, I think my editor and I have, my editor's a little more literal than I am. Um, and it's good because it keeps people reading. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I would kind of wing, wing out. But um, I think in terms of, of what is framing the book, I think I have to begin there because I don't know about you, but I think for all, a lot of us who were privileged if we didn't have frontline jobs as you know, healthcare workers or people who were serving food or people who were taking, you know, a lot of us were locked in with ourselves and our brains and our memories. And for me, it was a very, very intense period of personal reckoning, of looking at my past, of looking at relationships, of looking at situations where I definitely could have handled things better, of just deep, deep and sometimes very torturous self-examination and, and really reckoning with myself as we were looking at this country which was in the throes of so many different kinds of reckonings, whether it was the failure of the healthcare system and failure of the healthcare system to protect the patients and the healthcare workers, or whether it was the horrible knee on the neck of George Floyd, which just, you know, catalyzed this incredible uprising, which seemed that it might become a very, very important and revolutionary reckoning. Um, there were just so many reckonings going on, and I and I thought to myself, like, how this since I've been in this country, which is my life, it's a country that has kind of diabolical amnesia, right? It 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 refuses to remember, it refuses to acknowledge, it refuses to even look at the ground that we're standing on, which is stolen lands. Um, moving, you know, moving in that early period into genocide and the destruction of the indigenous people who were here, moving from then into 500, 400 years of slavery, into Jim Crow, into mass incarceration. Like, there is so much unreckoned with in this country. And I think so many of our, you know, I was thinking the other day, why do we have 400 million guns and 20 million 20 million AK-15s, assault rifles, 20 million? Like, why? Why? What has happened here? And a lot of it, I think, is, is I think when we don't reckon with things, it becomes hard, fixed, violent matter. It, 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 it starts to reinfect you and toxify you and hurt you and create more and more hurt. And I think... 
I was very excited during COVID because I thought maybe we're going to see the beginning of this reckoning start to happen. And I, I, I felt like I was writing into that with the hope that, okay, so, it, so in a way the book is organized in these stages and themes of various reckonings, you know, reckoning with walls, reckoning with mother hunger, reckoning with AIDS, reckoning with femicide, you know, things that are past and things that are present. And sometimes I don't even know what's past and present anymore because right. we're fighting the same struggles over and over and over. Right. And, I, you know, I was talking to R and Dottie Roy the other day and we, we were both saying, like, how many times can you write the same article? How many times can you just keep writing the same thing over and over, you know, giving it another spin or trying it from another angle or doing it from the uh, da da da, putting a dance on, putting a cap on? Like, how many times can we say it? And yet, patriarchy is insistent and stubborn and intractable, you know? Yeah. One of the things, you know, I, I, I'm looking through, reading through this collection, there are so many pieces that speak, you know, very specifically to a specific past moment, maybe one in your own life and some that very specifically speak to a very, very present moment, things that were written last year, um, you know, in response to Roe v. Wade being overturned. Um, and then there are some that feel like these just, the one that feels like the most devastating ca time capsule to me um, is the one I, I believe, I, I can't remember wh what venue you wrote it for in the summer of 2016 saying, yes, let's hope that Trump is the one to unite us Mm -hmm. against him and you know this is you know to say this isn't who we are to say um, that broke my heart um, I wonder as you look at, at that piece or at you know pieces that you um, maybe that maybe were older than that um, do you feel like they are still do you, do you feel like you would want to go back and tell the person who wrote them something different? Do you feel like you want to go back and, and just, you know, or, or is, is the world that you saw yourself in, is that still the world we're in? I'm not sure that makes sense as a question, but. I think I understand what you're saying. I don't know, I mean, I think, I think so much of what was happening before Trump, you know, I remember I called a meeting um, 90 months before Trump even announced. Mm -hmm. And I called all these activists together in New York and I said, he's going to run for president. He's a hologram of this country. He is a popular figure on television and we cannot underestimate popularity on TV. And I said, he has a very good chance of winning. Mm -hmm. And everybody thought I was crazy. Mm -hmm. There was just like, okay, you've really gone over the deep end this time, you know. I can't tell you how many letters I have subsequently got from people who came to that meeting. Oh, and, wow. um, but I knew in my gut, because I'm, I've lived in New York my whole life, and I've been protesting Donald Trump my whole life. Mm. Um, as a matter of fact, years ago, when um, under Reagan, um, who is also, I hold, equally re responsible for the downfall of America, um, under him, there, when homelessness was really ripe and they were saying ketchup was a food and all of yes. that, um, and Donald Trump was like gentrifying New York radically, um, we had, did this thing where we had something called brunch at the, tr at, at, at the plaza, and I got buses. And this is when he owned the plaza, presumably. It was when he owned the okay. plaza, and I, I got buses and buses of homeless people to come, and we set up tables in front of the plaza with beautiful tablecloths, we got people dressed in beautiful waiter outfits, and we served thousands of homeless people at the plaza. Oh my God. And uh, yeah, no, it was amazing, it was amazing. Um, and and I, they were called unhoused people now, I, I, I realize that. And, um, and people were actually sending out food from the hotel, oh. right? And it was a very radical action, but I've been, I've been protesting him my whole life in New York. So I know who he is, and I think, I think actually I wish I had been more extreme <laughs> in what I had written yes. looking back. Yeah. But the thing is, if people aren't awake to something, they're not awake to something. You can pound the table, you can pound the, until people wake up and see, you know, and people just didn't believe it. Nobody believed it. And, and he's such, he, to me, he epitomizes some element of America, something about America where people look at him and think, he made it, he's a, he's, you know, he, he's a he Pulled himself up from his boot, by his yeah, bootstraps. He, exactly, <laughs> not, not, there were no bootstraps involved, <laughs> you know. No. Oh, right, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, do you think that we, 
are we doomed as humans just always to recognize things when it's too late? Is there something about humans that just wants to stay happy and wants to put you know, the unpleasantness out of our mind? Or is that certain people? Or is that Americans? Or is it something about the current moment? I'm so glad you asked me that question. Because I think the biggest problem we have right now is that we don't want to look at, at the hard truths. Right. We don't, you know, we don't want to face the trauma of this country, the history of this country, the reality. I was just reading this amazing book called um, Poverty by America. It's such an incredible book on poverty and the roots of poverty, but also how all of us, all of us are connected to everybody who is poor and, and there's no separation. And I think, I think what's happened in this country is we've all been sold this bill of goods that we're not meant to be in pain, we can't touch sorrow, we, 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 can't, we can't get overwhelmed, we're so fragile, we can't think about death, we can't, we can't think about anything, right? And in fact, my experience has been when you walk through the wound, that's where liberation lies. If you sit, if you sit outside the wound, you sit here, that's when you get sick. That's when it's always making you um, more angry, more toxic, because it's just beaming it. But when you go through the wound, things begin to transform. And I think, what I think about every day is how do we help people, support people, engage people, convince people that looking at our history, that looking at our story is going to be the path to a future that is tenable for a lot of people, right? And I don't know the answer to that, but I'm just doing, I, you know, I sometimes think I should just have a t-shirt that says trigger warning. Like, because I feel like everywhere I go, I'm like everyone's worst trigger, you know? Like, I'm at, at parties, people are like, so glad you came. Okay, you can go now, you know? Uh. But I mean, that's something, certainly that's something that writing can do. That's something uh -huh. that theater can do. That's something that, that the printed page can do. Um, so, you know, I... How beyond, I mean, I think that, that that's how you have those difficult conversations. That, you know, in the couched in fiction, that's how I have those difficult conversations. Yeah, I would like to know how you deal with that. I mean, I think I just, I, I think, honestly, a nice thing about fiction is that people take their medicine sometimes without realizing it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I wrote I wrote a big novel about AIDS, and it was picked up by a lot of people who never would have picked up a big nonfiction book about AIDS. Right. And I would have people, you know, Women who I would just say, like, I kind of would stereotype as perhaps having been a Reagan voter come up to me at book events and say, oh, I had no idea all this was happening. And like, yeah, didn't? Okay, <laughs> great. Glad you're clocking it now. Like, <laughs> we can yeah. talk. Um, but there's, there's something I think about fiction. And for me, that's kind of my solace is I can put, I can write, even when I don't have, you know, even when I have more confusion than answers myself, I can still address those things head on. I can work that out on the page. Um, I imagine for you, you have this, you know, it's this very direct form of address that is the monologue or that is the, you know, the essay. Um, for other people, you know, for people in the audience who um, maybe don't consider themselves writers, although everyone should consider themselves a writer, um, but that's you know not their main form of communication. What you know? How can they start those conversations? Is it starting with yourself and looking at the painful things? Is it starting with finding someone to talk to about it? What would you say they should do? Well, I think you know if I look at the vagina monologues, for example, um, I think begin where you're curious, begin where you don't know, yeah. begin where you're afraid. Like if I'm afraid to look at something, I know that's where I have to go and look because that's where the charge is, and that's gonna be, right? That's, that's, that's where the door is gonna open. And I think with the vagina monologues, like if I look back on it, I was talking to a woman in her 50s who was a feminist, a forward-thinking feminist who was going through menopause, and she just was talking about her vagina with such contempt, you know, like that it was dried up and finished and prune-like and disgusting, and I was like, oh my God, I was, I was really horrified. And I thought to myself, wow, is this what women think about their vaginas? So I, I would just casually say to someone, what do you think about your vagina? And, <laughs> and, and the first woman I said it to said to me, my mother used to tell me, don't wear panties underneath your pajamas. You need to air out your pussycat. <laughs> and I thought, okay, this is really interesting. Yes. you know. And, 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 and I think 
once you op if you're curious about something, if you need to know about something, that's that's where I always begin. Either either I'm afraid of something, or I'm angry about something, or I'm really curious. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's it, it's something that you know. There's a certain. It's not only the courage of facing something, but it's the courage of letting go. Mm -hmm. And the the line of all the lines in your book, for some reason, the one that hit me the hardest, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to kind of mangle it. You're, you're talking about race, and you're saying that we have this, there's this anger of why I'm, I'm mad at you because you keep reminding you how I hurt you, or you keep reminding me how I hurt you. Mm -hmm. um, and it it, first of all, that was other... I phrased it badly. It's very beautifully put in the book. Um, and it just was like, oh, God, yes, this is something I've never seen crystallized in, in, in that exact way before. But it's also like, yeah, the letting go of anger, letting go of recriminations, letting go of resentment. Um, it's very scary sometimes to think of what's underneath, mm -hmm. right? Because what's underneath the anger might be guilt. Mm -hmm. um, and those are the, you know, it, it's that, that process of letting go. Um, do you, I mean, one of the things this is actually leading me actually perfectly into something else I wanted to ask you about, because, you know, a lot of the reckonings in the book are about the country, they're about family, they're about betrayal, they're about violence against women that, that you had no part in. And then you have this incredible apology to Mother Earth partway through, that is you calling yourself out. Um, and really not only, you know, addressing something head on, but peeling away, you know, like, like, let's, let, let me turn this back on myself. Let's see what's there. Can you talk about that? And can you talk about maybe any uh, other ways that, that, that same, um, letting go and, and, and seeing yourself in the mirror might've come through in the pieces here? Mm. I think, I, I, and also what you were just talking about, about that thing of, of, we don't want to look at where we've hurt people because we don't know what to do with that. We don't, we don't know what to do with it. Ra rather than just sit in it and grieve it and feel badly, we get defensive and we close it off rather than, you know, I've been, I've been preparing this class on apology because I'm really interested in apology as a practice, not as a simple saying, but like, what if we taught it the way we taught meditation or we taught prayer? Like, what if we really taught in-depth apology? And it's very clear to me that the non-apology is one of the columns that holds up racist capitalist patriarchy. Yeah. It, it, it's like, if, if you think about, you know, one of the reasons I wrote the apology was, I was thinking all the years I've been active in this movement, I had never heard a man apologize publicly for raping or beating someone, ever. Yeah. And then the Me yeah. Too movement happened, and I never saw one man come forward mm -hmm. to do a deep, complex, reflective, and, and then I started thinking, wait a minute, is there anywhere in history where a man has apologized for sexual abuse, and I could not find one. And so I thought, this is very powerful, mm -hmm. that in all of history, we don't have one public apology by a man, so there must be something to this. And then I started to realize that it is really what holds up this whole hierarchical system of dominance, because once you apologize, you humble yourself, right. you equalize yourself, you become on the same level as you're a human being, you're flawed, you're not all powerful, you're not all this. And, and I think, I guess for me, in, in after writing the apology, it was so clear to me, I had apologies to make. And I actually made quite a few of them. I wrote letters to people, I sat down, even for things that I, I didn't think I was totally responsible for. I, I, I took people out to lunch, I apologize, and when COVID ended, I took people out to lunch. I said, I see where I was wrong in these situations, and I want to own it. And then I had moved to the country after I had cancer like 13 years ago. And I just realized how many years it took me to see the earth, because I lived in the city for so long. I didn't appreciate the earth. I didn't protect the earth, I didn't honor the earth, I just saw her as something I had to get through to get about my day, you know? And I realized writing that apology, it was very painful because I had to really own 
how, how shallow I was, it really how, how, um, how I didn't cherish her, how I didn't honor her, how I didn't, all of those things. But when it was over that apology, my whole relationship to the earth changed mm -hmm. because I felt she took me in. She embraced me. She got that I was seeing her, and she got that our relationship had changed. And I just want to say that I think we're so scared to apologize, and yet I have to say it's the most liberating thing in the yeah. world. It's the thing that frees you. It lets all the microbial karmic clutter and sludge yeah. that's around your life, it just lets it go so that you can be free. And who cares if you're right? It's so boring to be right. It's just such a boring idea. Okay, so you're right. You win. Okay, now let's now let's have a life. You know, um, and I think that that kind of mindset keeps this whole structure in place, so that we keep having wars. We keep repeating all. You know, each generation of the family keeps repeating the secrets and keeps holding the same resentments and keeps spiraling around. It, this is making me think that it feels like the two places in our society that we get closest to a real culture of apology, one would be an organized religion where it's often not a person being apologized to, it's God being apologized to, right, right? atonement. And the other is Alcoholics Anonymous, right. which right. is problematic, you know, it's like, you know, the, there are pros and cons to that whole thing, but um, those are the, the few apologies I've gotten randomly in my inbox. Mm -hmm. Someone uses certain wording and I'm going, oh, you're going through a 12-step program. Right. I, I get what's happening here. Yeah. Um, but it's it's um, it's interesting that that's just not um, uh, there's no formal venue for that. There's None. no yeah. There's yeah. It's interesting because when I, I I spoke at Riverside Church on apology on the alchemy of apology. Right, you have this essay in the book. And, yeah. And somebody said to me at the end of it, ministers came up to me and they said, I don't know why you didn't quote the Bible. Oh. And I said, well, there's actually no passages that I yeah. can find in the Bible about apology. No. They, there are apologies about forgiveness, yeah. but I'm wary of forgiveness without apology because yes. it's, it's kind of a lame, it, 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 what is that except a Band-Aid? You know, yeah. survivors are told to forgive and, and black people yeah. are told to forgive and, and, and anybody who's been hurt. But if, if there hasn't been a reciprocal process where somebody has opened the door or you've opened the door, to an apology, then that forgiveness is, isn't really based on anything, yeah, you know? Yeah. And it's not true, and it can actually do more harm in the long run, because it's a cover-up. You know? Right, right, and that, that idea that uh, the people could feel that they're deserved, they're, that they are owed forgiveness, or that the apology is for the, is, is in order to serve the outcome of forgiveness, which exactly. is, can't, I don't think can be part no. of a true apology. No, no. Yeah. And, and I, I think there is an alchemy that occurs in apology that feels what a forgiveness might feel like. It feels like you're releasing something, like the tentacles that you've held onto let go. And I want to say, the exercise of writing a letter to yourself from your perpetrator, it's very effective. And, and actually, it's been adopted at the City of Joy as a technique they're using for women who've gone through serious sexual abuse from perpetrators they who were anonymous and who, who attacked them during the war. And the women are now writing apologies to themselves from their perpetrators and having incredible results in terms of releasing resentments, self-hatred, rage, all of that. So if you can't get a, an apology from your perpetrator or for someone who's harmed you, I strongly suggest writing the apology to yourself from them. Because what I know is particularly if we've been abused as children by people we know, we hold and carry our perpetrators in our bodies and beings. And they are as present inside us once they've entered us in their violation. So if you shift how they live inside you, and if you free them out of you, you actually get free. And you can do that by writing their apology to you. That's, I, I, I um, was, I am a survivor of childhood sexual abuse, and I cannot imagine doing that. I would love to be able to do that, and maybe, you know. I'll support you anytime Thank you want you. to. No, Thank I, you. I mean yeah, it. I I'll be your it. person. Yeah. Who, yeah. Because I'll tell you, it takes steps, and it's hard, and it's excruciating, but I learned so much about my father yeah. in doing that, and not to justify what he did, but in understanding what he did, I realized it had nothing to do with me. Right. 
Like right. it was his story, it was his lifeline that he brought into his relationship with me that allowed all that to go on. Mm. I was just merely the person, the person standing there, yeah. you know? That's amazing. I mean, that's, I, I feel like there's just a kind of a, a wisdom um, beyond what most of us will ever get to, but that we can aspire to, <laughs> I mean, to that. Um, so, um, so just, we're, we're very lucky to have that wisdom coming to us. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I, um, and I know in maybe, is it in five minutes or in something like that? Or something like five minutes, we're going to open for questions so people can start thinking of those. Um, I um, would, just changing gears, I really would love to talk to you about the AIDS section of your book because mm -hmm. that is something that I've written about. It's something, you know, a subject that I, that I hold very close. Um, I'm interested... In, in partly, not only in the writing of my book, but in the conversations I've had with people afterwards, um, in the, for, you know, what seems like for the most part, a real, a real gap, a real silence for a long time um, from the early peak of AIDS in, in the US um, until quite recently. Um, and certainly there were things that were being written. I don't mean that there weren't Michael Cunningham, Susan yeah. Sontag, yeah. there, are things, there are things being written, but felt like just a valley mm -hmm. in, in a lot of ways that maybe now, maybe it's that people are realizing they have limited time to tell their own stories, maybe mm -hmm. it's something else. But I'm wondering um, if you can talk about how long it took you to look back with any clarity on you know, those episodes of your life. And if you feel like you have any insight into the distance that was needed or the distance that a lot of people need to look back on, that, you know, real, you know, it's not just grief. It was also profound betrayal. Um, and I, I wonder if you can speak to that. Well, you know, actually, all the pieces in that book I wrote at the time. Okay. And I wrote a play called Extraordinary Measures. Um, I had a dear friend named Paul Walker who was this genius theater artist. And um, he was just one of the most precious, brilliant people. And he was directing a play of mine about um, homeless women called Ladies. And on the first day of rehearsal, he got diagnosed. Mm. So it was a devastating thing because he was descending. He was in descent. Right, right. He was literally lying on the floor during rehearsals like he couldn't get up. And um, it was a devastating, just a devastating period because so many of our, our friends were dying. And But when, when Paul was dying, um, a, you know how theater artists are, we're crazy people, and all of us were at the hospital, and it became this wild scene. He was on a respirator, and everybody was had a story about who he was, that they needed to see him, that he, ha he w they were closer to them than the person before who had just spent 15 minutes and why didn't they get a half an hour? And, and so I was at the hospital for days and I thought, oh my God, this is such an incredible play. You know, yeah, like, right. like of all these people with, you know, uh, while this person's on a respirator going through their projections, their desires, their... And so I wrote this play um, for a brilliant performer named Celeste Lacine who was one of the great one person, and, and he played all the characters, and he played Paul dying. And, and it was an amazing, amazing experience because it became literally a place for grief. Yeah. And people would, because we were in the middle of it, so people would come to see it over and over, and they would just come and weep and weep and weep. And I look back now, and we did it a couple years ago, Celeste performed, was invited to perform, and it was al almost more devastating now. Mm -hmm. Because I think when you're in the middle of something, the betrayal you're talking about, the, the way nobody was paying attention and nobody cared, the fact that people who were dying had to go and throw themselves on the streets and throw themselves against buildings so that people would care. It was such a grotesque, just a grotesque period of death, of betrayal, of discompassion, of, but also of people really rallying together to create the most beautiful movements and the most beautiful moments of care and the most beautiful moments of tenderness. So it, it, was, oh, it was all those things, you know? Yeah. 
do you feel it? I mean, I was. I just want to say oh. I was so touched and impressed by your ability to feel that time. Oh, thank you. Having never really been, you know, you were. I was very, a kid. You were. You were a baby. <laughs> yeah. You, you know. Yeah. You know. And 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 that speaks so deeply of your own compassion and ability to move into some other Thank consciousness. You. Well, the other thing that it, it speaks to was the um, the willingness of a lot of people, especially in Chicago, to sit down and talk with me. Yeah. And they were revisiting that time. And in, in so many cases, it's not that they were revisiting it for the first time, of course, but the specificity of my questions was kind of bizarre. It was like, what color was the carpet in Illinois Masonic yeah. Hospital? Yeah. And um, that it would bring up memories. And I have a lot of people say, oh my God, I haven't thought about this in 30 years, but... Um, or they'd get up photo albums that they had not cracked mm -hmm. in a very long time. And it was, it, it's a, what you're talking about, that, that act of looking back, of facing something directly. Um, but, you know, when there's, you know, there's, there are so many reasons for a culture of silence mm -hmm. around that, getting past that mm -hmm. is, is hard. And right. there's still so much silence. There's still so much AIDS now. Yes. And again, the people who are suffering the most from it are people who are not taken seriously, or people who mm -hmm. don't people don't care about right. whether right. they're Africans, whether they're marginalized communities, whether they're people who are you know. Mm -hmm. We still don't care mm -hmm. enough about people who have AIDS. We still don't care enough about people who have long-term COVID right. or, or immune suppressed and are living right. in their houses and can't go out. Right. You know, people just get disappeared. Appeared, you know, yeah. and erased in this culture. You know? This is this is actually the second part of what happens with the the woman who comes up and says, "Oh, I had no idea." Is and they'll often say, "Like it just, you know, I wish I could just go back in time and do something." And this is when I, you know, depending on how much I want to bum them out, go, "Oh, well, there was there are still 1.1 million Americans living with HIV. Would you like the names of a couple of foundations?" Yes. <laughs> and yes. to their credit, some of them have said, "Oh my God, yes," and some of them have kind of gone, "Oh, Bob," <laughs> and kind of, you know, <laughs> but. Um, it's it, something for me, uh, there was this moment early on in COVID when it became clear mm. that black and brown populations were dying so much more quickly and that it was people in cities and it, you know people with lower income, people without health insurance. I went, oh God, I've seen this before mm -hmm. and this is when they stopped caring. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. COVID of course played out a little differently, right? Because it became more rural, it became more, uh, you know, long stories about vaccination, et cetera, right? But there was this moment just in, in late spring of 2020 when I went, I've seen this mm -hmm. fucking movie before. Yep, yep, yeah. yep. No, exactly. Yeah. Same story, mm -hmm. same mm -hmm. story. Yeah. And also the ill-preparedness and, and, and the, way, the way healthcare workers get treated. I mean, the fact that I, 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 I did a piece, I worked with the National Nurses um, Union during COVID and um, created a piece called that that kindness, where I interviewed a lot of nurses about what they were going through and then put this piece together where a lot of beautiful people performed it in theaters, did it all over America, to really honor our nurses who, I just I, I just bow down to them every minute of my life. You know, nurses, mm -hmm. nurses okay. saved my life, you know? Um, okay. And I really think I really think they are as close as we have to saints in this world. Um, mm -hmm. What they do, the way they do it, um, and, and, and the way we don't respect them, the way we were putting them in garbage bags and, 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 and reusing masks and sending them in and not thinking about them and not paying them for their labor and not honoring them. You know, we, we, we banged some pots and pans for a couple of weeks and then we forgot about them. And I, and I really feel like that's what I mean about diabolical amnesia. We aren't consistent in our love. We aren't consistent in our care. We don't stay with people, you know. The, in, in, in celebrating our 25th anniversary of V-Day this year, we had a really glorious event in New York on February 1st, and activists came, you know, there were a thousand people, and it was just amazing to see all these people from our movement. And one of the things I, I feel is what is movement building? Movement building is committing yourself to the long haul to people who are struggling for the same ends.
and not quitting them and not canceling them and not firing them when they're wrong, but believing that we're all doing our best, trying to evolve, trying to get to a better consciousness. And I feel the same way with the people who take care of us, whether it's ter teachers or mothers or nurses or nannies or farmers. Like, we have to value them and see them and acknowledge them. For God's sakes, women who were working in restaurants, there was something called masculine harassment. Did you hear about this? No, there were parts of the country where men were saying to women, take down your mask so I can see if you're pretty enough to get a tip, right? They had, like, literally, women were getting sick from this, okay? So this is what I'm saying, like, who do we value? Who do we care about? Who do we focus on, right? Amazing. I, um, I believe we're going to start audience questions um, I think in just a second. So I'm going to I'm going to ask you my last question, which is um, you know, like you said, you you know, you joked about having the trigger warning t-shirt, but I think there is also um, of course such uplift in in what you write at the same time. So where are you finding joy right now? Nature. <laughs> um I, I just have to say, I was leaving my place this morning and like all the tulips were blossoming and the oh. jonquils and the lilacs. And I just, I just, for me now, I mean, it, people who know, knew me from before, because I was such a city person, um, I'm finding joy. I'm finding joy in my friendships. I'm finding joy in my family. I'm, I'm really finding joy in dancing and dancing and dancing. I think the more I move my body and lift weights and keep my body alive, the more joy I have. And I think we don't dance enough in this culture. We, really don't. we, you know, at City of Joy, at City of Joy, they literally dance from class to class. And they have literally hours of the day where they dance. And when you walk into City of Joy, there's a, there's a gate and it opens, you can feel the joy. It, I never knew joy until I went there because joy is very laced with high gratitude. They're very connected. And when women dance all day and would sing all day, it just escalates joy. So I don't think we, I think we should just dance more and more and more um, and, and find ourselves dancing whenever we can because it does something alchemically to the body where it makes you feel connected to whatever divine spirit it is and each other and each other. That's amazing. I, I'll take that as a challenge. Okay. Go, home and, <laughs> go home and dance a little. Um, so someone out there has, I believe, a microphone, and there are lights and all of that. And I believe that the person with the microphone will come to you when you yes, have a question. If you have a question, please raise your hand. We do want to remind you to keep it to a question and your comments to a minimum. <laughs> please speak clearly into the microphone. First question's right here. Hello, thank you so much for being here. I'm a teacher in the inner city of Chicago, and in the profession that I'm in, I deal with students, especially girls, that deal with rape, trauma all the time. I've just been accepted to grad school for trauma theory, working in the moment in those times where they reveal what they have. As also a theater teacher who was fortunate enough to be in the vagina monologues in college, Love screaming cunt to my mother's face. That was wonderful. <laughs> How else can I empower those girls to continue to speak mm. and continue, oh, I'm going to cry, and continue to find their voice? Because mm. I've had moments where I've had a girl look at me and I turn to her as her perpetrator. And everything I heard and everything she said to me, she was saying to him. Mm -hmm. How do I, as a teacher, hold on and ground myself? And how else do I continue to empower these black and brown babies who live in it every day. Mm. I think the fact that you're already getting them to talk about their experience is so amazing. But I think what you were talking about fiction, I think sometimes if we can give people like the ability to tell stories that aren't necessarily about them, but where they can create stories that have different outcomes, where they can create plays, where people have different outcomes, you know. We do this exercise at City of Joy where you take a situation that you were in and something that happened to you, and usually women always pick their rapes, and you redesign it, and you, you have it come out a different way. 
and then you get you you hire you 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 know you cast all the people you want in your play and you give them the lines and then you all perform that show with a different outcome and it is amazing what people come up with it's amazing like somebody intervenes and protects them somebody knocks that person out someone shoots them someone i mean but but what happens is you can see that there are people around you who have your best interest and that every situation isn't going to be like the situation you had. So I think the more you can give them other things than their trauma itself, right? Like, you know, what's a vision of, of, of another way? What's a story you want to tell about how it didn't happen like that? You know, ask them what they would change their name to and tell the story of that name. You know, um, I think... I think sometimes, w w particularly with young girls, repeating the trauma over and over gets them to shut down because it's too much. But I think if you can get them to fictionalize it or tell the story of somebody else or, you know, um, and, and in terms of yourself, you, you have to take care of yourself too. You know, I, I think um, I heard a lot of stories for a long, long time you know, because I was traveling the world for many, many years listening to women, and it was a huge honor and a huge privilege that women told me their stories. But I didn't protect my body, you know, and if you're a porous person, and I think most writers are porous, and most artists are porous, um, and most, you know, a lot of us are porous, it goes in, and it can do things to you. So I think you have to, like, that's why I believe in dancing, because I think dancing, screaming, moving, getting things out of your body um, daily, right? Because if you're in those situations, you're receiving trauma and it's, it's moving into you. And for me, it eventually formed itself into a huge tumor, you know? Um, but I think daily care, daily care. And I think also get them to dance. Get them to, f what are the things that give them joy? Where they can find their bodies that aren't in peril where their bodies aren't about to be attacked, where their bodies, where they can come into their bodies. Because anyone who's been raped or anyone who's been violated has left their body. So what are the things you can do to help people come back into their body and back into their strength and back into their muscles, back into their spirit? Mm. Next question is down in the front here. Thank you so much for being here. This is so wonderful. Um, I've been having all of these interesting conversations with young people, like eighth grade, junior high, that, 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 that time frame. And they're all so beautifully, no labels, and I'm on the spectrum, and I'm LGBTQ, and I'm this, and I'm that. And so when we start to talk about gender, especially when we start to talk about the feminine, I have this um, unexpected concern that has been creeping in my head, which is in service of this um, new way of looking at gender fluidity and this new way of looking at the world, which I love. There's also um, somewhere I feel like the feminine is getting lost. And I find it very interesting that at the same time this is happening in this beautiful way with young people, we're losing our rights, like, like women's bodies are losing our rights at the same time. And so I'm, my question is like how to, and I would explain, hey, this word is not a label, this word is used to empower. And they see the word as a label as opposed to an empowerment tool. And I can see that words obviously can be used both ways. So from your vantage point, what are you noticing in terms of like the intergenerational inter dialogue around the feminine as we are evolving. Mm. Do you want to answer that? You want me to answer that? <laughs> oh, that's you. Okay. Um, that you was know, really it's well a, put It's though. a very good question, and I think, um, like, I, I am so in love with this explosion that's happening, and, you know, the breaking out of binaries, and, and, and just the incredible bravery of exploration that's going on. And at the same time, I also feel um, that women's rights, have to be focused on. You know, woman is a political category. It's a political category. We haven't achieved liberation yet. Women haven't gotten free yet. And patriarchy is still here in a very present way. So I, I don't think it's either or. I think it's yes and. I think we have to find ways where everything gets embraced and everything gets lifted up. And 
I don't know. I don't have th that many issues with my friends when I talk about the fact that there is violence against all women, and I'm including transgender, and I'm including non-binary people, because there is lots of violence across the spectrum, right? And I think when we talk about our rights, we're talking about all of our rights, right? I see that as one thing. And I think everybody has the right to determine what they're gonna call themselves, who they are, what their identity is. I'm, you know, I'm 70, I'm a woman, I'm gonna die a woman. And that's not to say I'm not, they haven't opened the door for me to explore many aspects of myself that I hadn't thought about before, which I'm very grateful for. I don't know who I'd be if I grew up right now. I have no idea. It's amazing what's happening. It's, it, it, and it feels so, I feel like maybe it's gonna be the thing that brings patriarchy down. Maybe it will be the thing that brings patriarchy down because it's busted up that binary. So I think we have to find, you know, it's what I used to feel about um, shelters. Why were women leaving their house to go to a shelter when a man beat them up? Okay, why was the man going somewhere? And the answer was because the woman needed to be protected. So it was, for me, it was always a stopgap measure Right? It was like we needed to do that until we got to the next place. And I feel in some ways we need to keep fighting for the rights to our bodily autonomy, the rights, you know, all the rights that we've been fighting for, and simultaneously embrace everything that's happening. And I think they go together. I, th I think we often get into this thing of either or in this country, like is this or that as opposed to this and that. You know, let's do it all, you know, if that's helpful. We have time for one more question. And if no one wants to ask it, awesome. I'll spare you my funny question. And hopefully we can have a serious one. Oh no. Hi, uh, thank you so much for all of this. Uh, it was incredible. Um, I guess I'm just wondering, I, I really appreciated what you said about like long haul COVID um, sufferers and the immunocompromised and uh, the disappeared right now. Um, and I'm just really intrigued by both of you um, having a lot of uh, passion for um, AIDS advocacy um, and, and history and present day work and things like that. And do you think there's any way back to people caring about COVID at all? I'm really happy you asked that question. You know, um, I have a lot of dear friends who are immune compromised, who feel like they've been left, who feel like the world's moved on and abandoned them. And it really disturbs me, and it keeps me up a lot at night because they're in really bad shape um, in terms of mental health. They don't feel like anybody cares. And because people don't wear masks, and because people don't, you know, they can't go out. They're literally living, I have one of my dearest friends who lives in the Philippines, and she's lived by herself for three years because she's immune compromised. And uh, that question is such a good question because are we going to think about people in this country who got sick from COVID? And are we gonna think, how are we gonna live as a collective human body so that they can be free to come out of their houses and live? Or are we gonna just say they're gonna be locked away forever, right? Because if, if you have, if you have um, blood cancer, or there are, or there are a list of things. If you get COVID, you can die. It's just that simple. So what are we thinking about as a country, as a, as a people, to make it so those people who have immune compromise can live in a way where they feel accepted, invited, loved, nurtured, and cared for? And it's something I'm thinking a lot about myself, and I think we all should be thinking about it. Like, how in your own community are you thinking about immune compromised people who you haven't seen around? Where are they? You know, are you going to visit them? Or, you know, I made a commitment to my friend that I would call her every single night during COVID, no matter what. And for two years, I called her every single night. And you know what? I know that kept her alive. So are we doing that for other people? Are we thinking about the people who can't come out? Are we thinking about the people who have become so inward Right, that they're scared to go out now. They're, you know that that you know being being social is a terrifying thing now. Um, I don't have an answer, but I do have a deep desire to figure this out. You know, 
it's just to bring something, bring it back to something we said earlier. Just the um, you feel sometimes, you know, like you're saying you're making the same argument again and again. And something that has happened with HIV/AIDS over decades, and something I think that's happened with COVID is it's just very hard. Honestly, for, for a working journalist, it's very hard to get a story approved when the story is, hey, things are still the same way they were last week mm -hmm. or last year. Um, that's not the kind of story that gets read. It's not the kind of story that an editor yeah. is going to assign or approve. And uh, understandably, um, we, can, we can push on that for sure. You could request more coverage, I guess. But it's also a reason that we need a plethora of ways to communicate about these things that are not the news. Mm -hmm. So... You know, is it the theater piece? Is it the song? Is mm -hmm. it the event? Yep. Is it the um, because we can't wait on the news to cover things that are ongoing. That's and that is where you know people have the number of people I met on the road touring for the Great Believers who really believed that AIDS was over. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and because they just hadn't heard about it in so long. Um, if you can't get the news to cover it, then what else can you do? Yeah, I, I think that is totally brilliant. I think what are the what are the stories we're telling, and where are we telling those stories? You know, there's a lot of groups for immune compromised people that they meet online, and you know, and they talk about what's going on. But I don't think we should create these two worlds. I mean, that's a very scary idea where there's, you know, it's it, it's it's like pushing people to the out to to be outcasts, and it can happen to anyone. Get long term COVID. You can you you can get a disease overnight, you know, uh, why aren't we living in a country where that is our priority, where the care of people and thinking about people and lifting people up and making people feel seen and, and, and nurtured is our priority here, right? That's amazing. And I think, I mean, I think, I feel like we're all leaving with a bunch of mandates like that, dancing, <laughs> expressing, you know, just there are so many things I want to go home and do. Um, Chicago Humanities Festival um, has a long history of bringing the absolute most amazing people to our city. So thank you to them and thank you to you for being one of them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.